you believe he's a God who hears your, your invitation? Do you believe it? Or do you believe it? Like down deep in here that he heard what you said, that you want him to come, and that he heard it and that he's here. Do you believe that? Awesome. Well, the word of God tells us that that Holy Spirit that comes leads us into all truth. Are you ready to leave what you thought might have been the truth at the door and receive what is the truth? I'm ready to give it if you're ready to receive it. If you are, let them know about that. Awesome. Awesome. Why don't we go ahead and uh, take a seat, please? Take a seat. I'm super excited to be here with you guys tonight. I'm super excited to see all of you. And I know that there's some folks watching on Facebook Live that are kind of here with us right now, even though they're not in the room. So we just want to welcome them as well into our sanctuary to hear the word of God and to uh, take what we hear and then respond in worship. You're going to have a few moments after we get done with the word of God to move from the hors d'oeuvre to the main course, which is to worship a mighty God. And so we're going to do that here in a few moments. Uh, why don't you do me a favor now and open up your Bibles, get a copy of God's Word in your hand, right? Who's got their Bible with them? Show me. Who's got their Bible with them? Awesome. I love that. That's good. Let's open it up to Matthew chapter 5, all right? Matthew chapter 5 is where we'll begin. Uh, we've been, uh, we started a series a couple weeks ago, and it's called uh, Red Wall, Red Letter. And uh, just in case you're wondering what that wacky title is, um, hey, Ramon, can you... Uh, you turn this uh, sub down a little bit for me? It's echoing my brain, and there's a lot of room in there, so it's real loud. Uh, so, so we started that, that. That wacky title is in reference to the wall that we, we saw when you were coming into the sanctuary. There's a wall there by the door, and it just says, together, let us ascend the mountain of the Lord. And so we wanted to try to unpack what all that meant, and what we're doing is uh, we're ascending the mountain, which, of course, is not geography, remember? Uh, it's really about position. It's about where God is and where everything, including you and I and everything that we know and, and don't know, everything's down here and he's where? He's up there and he's separated from all things. And so uh, we need to ascend the mountain of the Lord. Why? Because we learned in Genesis, it says that everything will be provided on the mountain of the Lord, that he wants us to come up into his presence and everything that our soul needs is there with God, and that's our sole provision, that's our best provider. And so we actually are going to study the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, and he is literally ascending a mountain and bringing people up there to, so he could pour out into them all this incredible teaching so that their life could flourish. And so that's what he wants us to do because everything is provided on God's mountain. And so uh, last week... I was supposed to start with the, the happies, you know, the, the blessed are thous, the King James Version. Bless, what does it say in, those, in that book? Blessed art thou, or something like that. Um, but but, but um, I kind of lied, and, and because I was reading the, the first two verses of, of, of Matthew chapter 5, and I was like, wait a minute, I, I, can't, I can't skip over that. I noticed something there, and we brought it to your attention last week, and I hope you saw it and dwelled on a little bit. It was a great picture here. Um, I don't know how big, you know, some <laughs> church people are so, fo so funny. They, they, instead, of, instead of trying to um, find some good things in a sermon that would encourage them, they love to pick it apart, right? So, hey, it, did, I had a couple of people say, hey, you know what? Uh, I've been to Israel and I've seen that mountain. It ain't a mountain, it's just a hill. M massive point miss, right? M epic failure, right? This, the point is this, is that it's a picture, right? It's a, that's what the scriptures are half the time. It's a picture of, of a spiritual reality, right? So it doesn't make any difference if the, it was a Everest or it was just a, a, a little hill for, you know, a 20-minute walk. I don't know how big it was. I wasn't there. And guess what? Those, those, those places around the Sea of Galilee and all that stuff that, that Jesus, that, like, that he was at, yeah, how many of those people were there when he was preaching that sermon? Yeah, none, because they don't really know which hill it was on. They don't really know where his tomb is. There's some 
speculation and conjecture, and that's all fine and good. The point is this, is that you see in the story that he is ascending the mountain, and he, we know from hindsight, from what he preached, he's given them all kinds of good stuff right there that we value, they would have valued, but they didn't ascend because there was a mountain there. And it became difficult to follow Jesus. And before the mountain came, they were all following Jesus. A bunch of, a huge crowd was following Jesus because he was casting out demons and healing people. He was making their life easy. So they wanted to, to follow them. But as soon as they saw a mountain in front of them, as soon as it was difficult to follow Jesus, they didn't. But the disciples did because true disciples know that God's greatest blessings are at the end of God's greatest trials in your life. Right? So they pressed on and they went up the mountain and they learned, man. And they learned. And, and so he wants us uh, to not give up on him so easily and he wants us to ascend the mountain. And so each and every single time we come into this place, that's his desire is that you would ascend the mountain and come into his presence and let him teach you. Sit at his feet, right? So uh, this week, finally going to get to the happy people. Okay? We're going to get to the happy people. We're going to figure out what it means to be happy, how to be happy. Everyone wants to be happy, right? The Beatitudes, that's what it means. Beatitudes, to be supremely blessed, to, to, to be well off, to, to, to um, be fortunate, uh, to be happy. Happy are those who. Happy are those who. Happy are those who. We're going to study that a little bit. I, I was studying this week in preparation for this, and I have to tell you that... Uh, I can't get through all the Beatitudes this week, and so uh, this will be, I've used a really creative me, um, series um, title this week. It's Happy People Part One. Hope you're impressed with my creativity. <laughs> and um, yeah, you can clap. Um, please don't. So um, we're going to study uh, happy people. And anybody in here want to be happy? I want to be happy, right? Okay, good. So I want to start by, by um, quoting something that's not there. I want to, I want to start by quoting something that's um, way to the left in your Bible. It's King Solomon in Ecclesiastes 1.9. He says something that doesn't really sound happy. <laughs> he says there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. That means anything you would lay your eyes to or hear or see or experience in your lifetime it's been done before. They may not have had iPhone 10s. But nothing is new. A more modern version of this truth is the more, this is where you get to be involved in the sermon. You guys ready? Okay. The more things change, the more they, yeah, that's the same thing, right? That's what, that's what Solomon was saying. There's nothing new under the sun. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And, and yes, geography and ethnicity and age and sex and religion and all that, it varies for sure. So there's some diversity amongst the human race. Um, I noticed when I moved down here to Florida from Massachusetts that all the houses here, or at least the vast majority of them, are all block homes, right? They're made out of block. And uh, up in New England, you very rarely see that. Here it's block on a, on a slab. Up in New England, it's what? They're stick houses. They're made out of predominantly wood, and they're built on basement. They have basements, right? Not too many people have basements down here, so there's a little bit of a, a difference in where we're living as far as our housing goes. And we all know what Florida houses look like, right? Like, there's, there's a difference. When you go to Georgia, there's a lot of, you know, big, uh, flat-faced homes made of brick, right? That's just kind of a Georgia, South Carolina thing. You come here, it's got all the stucco. They're made out of block. We've got a Florida look to it, so it's a little bit different, of course. Um, in big cities, you notice that, that people walk in lots of places. You know, in New York City, you don't see a whole lot of cars as much as you see people walking. You see a lot of cars, they're yellow. People take taxis everywhere, whereas out here in the suburbs where we live, you know, we just jump in our little car, our motorcycle, our SUV, our minivan, whatever, our pickup trucks, we jump in those things and we just drive everywhere we need to. So it's a little bit different, of course. You know, the diet in, uh, I don't know, use any two countries, Italy, is probably way different than the diet, the menu in, say, uh, Finland, right? It's going to be different. Um, 
speaking of diets, you know, here in the States, people spend 20 to 30 to 40 dollars a day to bring their dog next door to go to doggy daycare and they can pull their little smartphone out and they can watch little Rover play with Spot and go, oh, isn't that cute? And we spend endless money on our little puppies, whereas people in China, South Korea, Vietnam, Nigeria, and a whole slew of other countries uh, eat dog. It's a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah. Solomon was right, though. People may look different. They may eat different. They may speak Do you guys know, I, I, I didn't even know this, but did you know that there's somewhere around 6,500 distinct spoken languages on this earth? Right? That's big. Anywhere from 65 to 6,900. We don't really know exactly, but Solomon was right. We look different. We eat different. We speak different. But we're all of the human race. And we have a lot more similarities than we have differences, even though we may vary in behavior and look and the style of clothing and the music we listen to and all that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, wouldn't you guys all agree that there's kind of like a, a human way? Like, even though some people live in, the, in, in L L.A. and they drive Lamborghinis and they have, you know, penthouses up top and they're spending, you know, $25,000 a week on, on, and they have yachts. And, and then there's some people that live in the jungle and they live in huts and everything. But, you know, there's, there's a distinct difference between humans and any and all other beasts of the earth. We're just different, aren't we? And, and even though we act a little bit differently here and there, but there is kind of a, a human way of thinking and acting and doing, and that's just universal. Now I say that because here in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus mentions these nine beatitudes, right? These nine beatitudes. And all nine speak of things that are generally considered by at least most people across this. This is not just a little message to this little pocket of Christians right here in this room. This is a message to the human race. Because we're all generally the same. See, I could stand next to Miss Linda and you know that we're different, right? I wouldn't look as pretty as she does in her pink skirt. I wouldn't look that good. Like, we look different, but, but, but generally, like... For instance, we'll eat at a table, right? We don't crawl into a cave and drag in a carcass and start gnawing on a bone like a hyena. Like, we're people. We do that, right? So, so we're all kind of similar. And, and Jesus is speaking to, to all people here right now where he's kind of saying all these things in these Beatitudes, they're generally, to most people, if not all people, they're sort of unnatural, there's nothing new under the sun. We're all sort of similar. As a matter of fact, some of these are beyond unnatural. And they kind of slide into the undesirable. And, and so I want to I read these with you. And I'm reading out of the New Living. And I have to say I love this translation. But I don't love it here. But I'm going to read it. And you can read whatever version you have in front of you. I'm just going to read the first um, 11 verses. Are you ready? Okay, so let's read the Beatitudes. Let's read. This is, listen, this is Jesus Christ preaching a message. It's important, right? You give it your full attention. So one day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those. I don't like that. It's blessed are those, right? Blessed are those. Blessed are those, well off are those, fortunate are those, happy are those, happy are those who are poor in spirit or are poor and realize their need for him. See the reason why I don't like the New Living Translation? Just pause there a second. Because it says, realizes those who are poor. And when we say that those who are poor, there's predominantly one thought that pops into your head, right? Cash. And so that's just weak. Because that's not really what it means, Okay. But let's just read on. So God blesses, blessed are those who are poor in spirit or poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice or better translation, righteousness, 
for they will be satisfied. God blesses or blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses or blessed are those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Um, I'm going to get there probably next week, but just so you have some clarity, I just want to make sure you understand that no one will ever see God the Father. Do you understand that? He is a consuming fire. To see him, you would ignite like that and melt. So when it says that you will see God, you will see evidence of his power. You will see him move. You will see him do things, but you will not ever cast your eyes upon the Father. You understand? Okay. You will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses or or blessed are those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Okay, that's just kind of crazy right there. That should kind of give you an idea of what we're going to talk about here tonight. It'll all make sense. When you read that, it's like, he's like, wait, I want you to be happy about these things. These are not in the good column, yo. Right? When people do this, this is not making, generally speaking, no one on earth likes it when people lie and slander them. It's not fun. I don't like that. So these nine things in the Beatitudes, you wouldn't naturally move toward those nine things. This, I don't care what nation you're in, how old you are, when you grew up, no one is naturally going to move toward these nine things. But yet Jesus, listen, who, by the way, he's, he, is, he says, I'm building my church. He's building his church. Now, I don't know about you, if you were building something, wouldn't you want to tell people something that they liked? Something that would make them feel better? And I'm just reading this, I'm like, this is the worst campaign on the earth. What are you doing? But yet, somehow he's telling us that even though no one would really like to be ridiculed, no one would want to mourn, no one wants to do these types of things, no one moves towards us naturally, but yet he says somehow these are good, desirable, and beneficial for you. And the worldly, in other words, normal response or perspective on all of these nine things is generally negative in that... You may say, it's good to be humble. But people don't like to be humble, right? So we, it's negative in that we don't generally do them, and we don't generally like this, right? And that's why it's negative. However, and I love this about the Bible, Romans 12, 2 says that we should let God change you into a new person by changing the way you think. Right? See, that's what you're doing here right now. You're coming in and you're, you've got the word of God open. And as, as you read it, he's reprogramming you. See, Je- Jesus is doing a major defrag on your spiritual hard drive. Do you understand? Do you know what a defrag is? Does anyone not know what a defrag is? Yeah, a defrag, listen. Sometimes when you put stuff into your computer, it gets logged into the memory of the computer, into the hard drive, in a place where it really didn't belong. And so guess what? It slows up your computer. So as you bring on your computer and you try to upload some programs and use it, it's slow. Do you ever notice that sometimes it's slower than normal? Because it needs to be defragmented. Things get filed in the wrong order, in the wrong place, and it slows up performance. And so Jesus is, he's trying to help you change the way you think about stuff, right? And that's what he's doing here. He's giving you some new perspective on some things that are normally in the bad column. He wants you to switch it over to the good column and have a different perspective on it. Here's the shift in thinking, okay? Christianity, or really Jesus, doesn't always remove stuff. No, Jesus empowers you to overcome stuff. That's what he does. Sometimes you ask... Right, And he removes you from the situation or he removes that problem from your life. And we praise him for that. That's awesome. Sometimes we pray to have that thing removed and he doesn't, but he's given you the power to overcome that. Right? He's given you incredible, he's given you the, this is what the scriptures say. And listen, at some point, I say this all the time and you guys got to get this right. You've got to. 
Make a decision of your will as a Christ follower that the word of God carries more weight than what you think, feel, your opinion means nothing in light of God's word. You understand? And so God's word says this. You can overcome because he's given you the mind of Christ. That means you can think differently about things than you did before. He's given you the Holy Spirit inside of you to convict you of sin and to lead you into truth, right? And to give you the authority to say, no sin. I'm not doing that, right? He's given you the power to do that. So it's different. He's given you, listen, he's given you a new reality. It's not the same reality that everyone else is living to. He's given you a new reality. I think this is what Paul was talking about in Romans 8.37. In Romans 8.37, he says, he says this, he says, despite all these things, you've got to wonder, okay, what does that mean? What, what things? What things are you talking about? So if you read that section of scripture, Paul says, he, he makes a list of some things. He says, in spite of the trouble, the calamity, the persecution, the hunger, the danger, and even the fear of death, even with all those things, right? And all those things, where would they normally go if there was a grid? Good column, bad column. It'd be in the bad column, right? These are things that we don't like. And Paul's like, yeah, despite all these things that you don't like that are happening to your life, overwhelming victory is yours in Christ. How can, this is what he's talking about. He's saying he doesn't always take away the death. He doesn't always take away the hunger. He doesn't always take away the calamity. But yet you still have victory. Because you can overcome all that. You don't have to let it affect you. You can rise above all that. It's a perspective, it's a new attitude, and it shapes a new reality for the Christ follower. And so, let's do this. Let's jump into the um, Beatitudes. Here, here's the first one. I, again, let's just look at what it says here. It says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. I want you to look up on, the, on, on here. Look up on the screen, though, especially if you don't have a Bible, you slacker. Notice that there's a small s there, okay? I just want to clarify. I want you to learn something here. It, it, most of the time, most of the time we see, see the word spirit in the Bible, we, we refer to the Holy Spirit, right? So it's so much so that when, when I was using the, the, the um, worship software that you are seeing being used up here on the screen that puts the, the words up there, it's a Christian program. It's for worship. That no matter what font I used, when I typed in the word spirit, it capitalized it. It does it on its own, right? And that's a boo-boo, because that's not what the Bible says here. It is not talking, it, this does not say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, like, like you're running low on the Holy Spirit, okay? That's not what it says, okay? When, when, but the Bible says in Ephesians 1.13 that when you said yes to Christ, he gave you the Holy Spirit, right? There's no shortage of the Holy Spirit in you, There may be an unwillingness on your behalf to let him fill you and control you. And sometimes we're not acting when, you know, like we should filled. So he's controlling us and we need to work on that and ask to be filled and lower our pride down and get humble before him and say, I want you to take over. Right. But he's not. He's willing. He's right there going, yeah, I'm ready to fill you up right now. Just ask and I'll do it. Right. There's no shortage of the Holy Spirit there. It's just a shortage of you asking and desiring for it. So it's really, if you look up in, the, in, a concor- in a concordance, what spirit means there, it means life. It means in your life. Those that are poor in their life, and I like this part of the new living because it gives clarity to it. They realize their need for him. They realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is yours. So last week we talked about not dating Jesus, right? Meaning that I, we're not supposed to play the field. We're not supposed to play the field with Jesus. We could date uh, other men and other women when we're younger. We do that. We play the field. And when one of them or two of them or three of them don't satisfy this particular need in my life, I call in the bullpen, I call in a substitute, and I drop that one and I go grab the other one so that I can be fulfilled. And Jesus is like, yeah, don't do that with me. Okay? We, we, we don't lean on other people or things for joy, peace, purpose, fulfillment, happiness, and I don't turn to these things when following Jesus is difficult or risky or complicated or scary. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is mine. Because I understand that kingdom of God results are always better than any other results. 
And so I trust him that even though he calls me to do something that I don't want to do and it's uncomfortable and difficult, come climb this mountain, kid. I strap on my boots, I put on my backpack, and I go even though I don't want to, even though I don't understand why I'm doing it, because I know at the top of that hill there's going to be something awesome, so I continue to follow him. Okay? That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to play the field. Beyonce said, if you like it, you put a ring on it. And that's what we're supposed to do with Jesus. You can't play the field. You're the, you're the bride of Christ. So poor in spirit means poor in life. That means realizing that nothing in my life on my own, especially anything I could possibly conjure up on my own, in my own skill, in my own ability, or any other horizontal avenue or option to satisfy my soul, none of them will work like God will. Okay? So I, I, I realize my need for Him. I don't want to seek fulfillment, purpose, enjoyment, happiness, nothing except in Him. Uh, early church leader, St. Augustine, um, I don't know, somewhere like 350 to 400 A.D., like that's a long time ago, right? He said this, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. What he's saying here is what I'm saying to you tonight, what the scriptures are saying to you in Matthew 5, 3. I'm happy because the only one with glorious, unlimited resource is my source. That's why I'm happy. And the best comes from him. And when I realize that, and I realize I don't need another source of fulfillment and joy and purpose and happiness, that's when I'm happy. And I'm not looking for love in all the wrong places anymore. Because I have found my true love, and his name is Jesus. There's an awesome picture of this. Sometimes, I don't know about you, some people need to um, hear it, some people need to say it, some people need to read it. Let's read it. Psalm 28. Do, do me a favor, turn there for a second. I want you to see how David illustrates this beautifully in this psalm. Take a look there. I'm going to read it with you. This is what King David's... Now listen, listen to this too. Listen. King David. Anyone else in here personally the king over a kingdom? I'm not, right? Put your hand down. <laughs> Kid, he's got his initials are JC. He thinks he's something else, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love you. So, so, like, what does a king have? Power, right? Authority. You think he's you think he's lacking in the cash department? You think if he wanted to, he could say kill that guy and he'd and he'd be dead, right? Like he's got he's got castles and money and armies at his disposal, and I mean he's a power he's a power he's the most powerful person in the kingdom, right? The king. And this is what he writes. This is he's saying, happy are those who realize their need for him. Like I can't do this with any other. Listen, I pray to you. O oh Lord, my rock, do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you are silent, I might as well give up and die. This is, this is a king, powerful man. And he's, you can, can you see it when you read it, that he's like pleading? Lord, if you don't come through for me, I am nothing. I am weak. I'm nothing without you. This is a king. Kind of puts it in perspective for me. I don't know if it helps you. For if you are silent, I might as well give up and die. Listen to my prayer for mercy as I cry out to you for help, as I lift my hands toward your holy sanctuary. So he's like, I, do you see it? In, like, I need, he realizes his need for the Lord, right? This is the mighty, powerful king of this nation. And he's like, I'm nothing without you. I need you. And so he goes on, he, I don't think we need to really read um, 3 
through 5. But he's, he's actually expressing his prayers at that point. So at first he's like, hey, he, I, I'm praying to you. I need you. I need you. I need you. Without you, I'm nothing. I realize my need for you. And so he lays these things before him that he needs. And then look what he says. And this is so cool. He says, praise the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. i got to stop there for a second. This was so incredibly powerful for me. And I hope that it, it's powerful for you too. He prayed at the beginning. He says, I need you, I need you, I need you. And listen, the moment he said his prayers, what did he do? He thanked him for hearing and delivering him. He believed that God heard him and responded. Do you do that when you pray? I don't always do that. I get whimpering and sad and say, God, please help me. And then I sit and wait for him to, I hope he heard. I hope he's not busy with the folks over in Texas and has time for me. Weak, right? He, 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 his, it was immediate. This wasn't in another chapter, man. Immediately upon putting his request at the foot of the cross, he, he says, praise the Lord for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust in him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. The Lord gives his people strength he is a safe fortress for his anointed king. Save your people. Bless Israel, your special possession. Lead them like a shepherd and carry them in your arms forever. Man, this is the king of the nation expressing his inadequacies and that all power and his whole source is God. And that's a picture for us as well. That's the way we should. Listen, happy are those don't you see him happy? Look at him. He said happy. The, 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 the beatitude is happy are those who realize their need for him. Look at him. Praise the Lord. He's heard my cry for mercy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving because the, the Lord has heard my prayer and he's going to deliver me. Woohoo! He's happy, right? It's a picture for us. It's a picture for us. All right, so here, here's the second one. It says, uh, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Isn't mourning kind of like bad, sad, terrible loss? Right? Like, who? You know, they used to have professional mourners back in the day. Back in Israel, that's what they used to do. They have professional mourners. They would pay these people to come in and mope and groan and sigh and cry. Like, you would, that's what they would do. In the Jewish faith, I don't know if you know this, that we have a thing called sitting shiva. And I don't mean shiva like Linda's doing right now, shivering because she's cold. I mean, they sit in mourning. And I think, I'm not quite sure because I was a naughty boy in Hebrew school, but I think it's like a week. They actually sit there for a week in a house. They wear dark clothing. The ladies put shawls over their heads, and they sit and mourn and groan and moan, and I'm unhappy. It's awful, right? It's bad. Mourning means to grieve the loss of something or someone. And listen, everyone mourns. I'm sure that everyone in this room has mourned at one thing or at one time or another. And listen, everyone mourns, including every Christian. Every Christian will mourn. You know, getting up here and, and, and saying, hey, Jesus is Lord, doesn't take away all the loss in your life. You're still going to suffer loss. We're not exempt from that in, in any way. But for the everyday Joe, mourning is it's in the bad column because it carries with it a lot of finality. He's gone, she's gone, it's gone, my job's gone, my money's gone, it's gone, it's not coming back, it's done. And that brings sadness. I was thinking about this this week, and there's this like, it's not a biblical proverb, it's just a stupid proverb, but people say it all the time, it comes out of that kind of mourning thinking, it's you only go around once, right? There's this massive concentration on, on the here and now. And the everyday Joe that mourns, he's, he's focusing on the here and now. So that's why he or she is so sad, because he's gone, she's gone, it's gone. I don't get it back. It's only one time around. And our culture, by and large, stresses the here and now to the neglect of eternal things. And that's why mourning is so painful for the everyday Joe, but that's not true. See, the, the, the Christ follower, he's been given a new reality. 
right? His, his reality is different, and we have to get to that place where it becomes your reality. Not just some great theory or idea, but it becomes the reality of your life, right? Mourning isn't final, and that's why you can be happy as you mourn. You don't have to be sad. Remember, it said, like I mentioned a little, a little bit ago, Ephesians 1.13, when, when, when you got saved, God gave you his Holy Spirit, right? So we, we, we don't just memorize that verse. We believe it, I hope, right, and are living that. And that Holy Spirit that God gave you, he does a lot of different things. He, 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 can, he convicts us of sin, and he, and he lets us know that there's a judgment coming. Be ready for that, right? And he leads us into all truth, right? This is what the Holy Spirit does. And he gives us gifts so we can use them to, ex, to, to express him and build up the body of Christ. But in John 14, 26, he's given a title and a description. He's the comforter. He's the comforter. So, so that's why those who mourn can be happy because we have the comforter, right? And not everybody has the comforter. We have the comforter. You have, Jeff, you have the comforter, right? You have, Holly, listen up. You got the comforter. It's good, right? You got the comforter. Hey, Nick, I know you can't hear me. You have the comforter. You have the comforter. And see, you know what the comforter does? He ensures you that although you die, you will live. Doesn't that feel good? Does it bring comfort to you? Just hearing that, that, you know what? If I got whacked by a bus tonight, that I'm not dead, I'm just transferring from one crappy place to an awesome situation. That, that's what it, he ensures you also that even though your loved ones who have embraced Christ by faith as their Lord and Savior, that if they get whacked by the same bus, they ain't dead. That you're going to see them again in glory. Eternal purposes, eternal focus, eternal perspective. And that's what Jesus is trying to do here. Doesn't it give you comfort knowing that even though someone that you cared for a great deal left you? But God never will. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I'm with you even to the end of the age. Like Jesus ain't going anywhere. We have unfaithful friends. We have unfaithful lovers and spouses and business partners, but that's not Jesus. And he comforts us in this. Doesn't it give you comfort knowing that even though you mourn the loss of a business or some income that was amazing, but now it's gone? Doesn't it comfort you knowing that God's word says that he who trusts in the Lord will lack no good thing? These need to shape your reality. This is the new reality for you. And like everyone, Christians will experience loss, but loss doesn't defeat the Christian because the disciple of Jesus has a different reality than everyday Joe. You're not everyday Joe. The Christian can still be happy in the face of loss because the comforter has reshaped their reality. God is with me. God provides for me. God lives in me so I never die. That is overwhelming victory. And that's our new reality. So here's another picture of that in the scriptures for us all to see. Psalm 30, 11 and 12 says this. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. So people, do you mourn? Someone that you love dies? Do you mourn? Yeah. And mourning can last for I don't know, a day or so, but at some point, the truth of God's word has to kick in, right? It kicks in. And, and I don't have to be sad forever that you've, you've turned my mourning into joyful dancing. Maybe you just need to, 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 to throw the shawl off, wipe your ashes off, and start doing the twist. And maybe you'll find a little joy. I don't know. Just a suggestion, right? So, so here, okay, here's, here's the third one. Blessed are those 
Now, nobody likes to mourn, right? That's not a normal good thing. And nobody, nobody likes to be, like, especially in America, nobody likes to be told that you're, that you're poor in spirit. Like, like, your life, you, you, Ricky, you really got nothing. <laughs> like, nobody likes to, nobody wants, like, they're not teaching that on TV. That's right, right, right. No one's teaching that. What are they teaching? You're awesome. You're amazing. Have it your way. Have it your way, right? That's what they're teaching. You are the center of everything. And so we create goods and services and products and cater to your needs and a thousand options and how would you like it? And if you don't like it this way, we'll do it that way for you because you are the king and I buy down to you. And, and Jesus is going, yeah, you know what's really awesome? When you realize you're nothing and I'm everything. Right? That's it. That is, that is not going to be on TV. Maybe Christian TV, but not normal TV. That's never going to be on TV. Okay, so here, here's, here's another one, right? Um, happy are those who are humble. Happy are those that are humble. Like that's the NLT. Uh, Holman Christian Standard says, huh, um, happy are those who are gentle. Blessed are the gentle. Um, King James would say, blessed are the meek. That's for you, Herb. Blessed are the meek, right? For they will inherit the earth. They will inherit, oh, like, okay, they'll inherit the earth. Like what in the world is that all, does that mean? Okay, so how about this? Um, let's, 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 let's have a little exercise here. How, tell me, when you think of super successful people, alive now or maybe not alive, but whatever, when you think of super successful people here on earth that, that quote unquote have it all, who comes to mind? Just throw out some names. Bill Gates. Who? The Kardashians. Trump. What else? Anyone? The Kennedys, the, the Facebook owner. King James, he had it all. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg or something? Zuckerman, Zuckerberg? Oprah. Henry Ford, Queen Elizabeth. Any others? So keeping all this, this list in mind, right, would you describe these folks like Trump and uh, Kennedys and, I don't know, all these super success, would you describe them as humble, gentle, meek, or are these like go-getters, bold, getting after it, leaders of industry, powerful people, right? Just, I, I just, when I think of, Okay, when I think of Donald Trump, okay, and you guys have your opinions about it, everybody has their opinion about him, and that's, I don't care about that. But when you, th I mean, that is, the last words you're going to think of is <laughs> meek and humble and gentle. Yeah. He, right? You can vote for him, you can not vote for him, whatever you want, I don't care. But that is no way to describe that man. But yet, in this world, right, he's got it all. I mean, he is loaded. He's got his own jet. Like, I'm not talking about like a personal jet. I'm talking like, like you would fly in on United. He's got his own with his own name on it, right? And, and, and he's married to a supermodel, and he's the president of the United States. He's the most powerful person on the earth, and he's worth billions, right? He has it all. He has it all. But even a guy like that, whether you like him, whether you dislike him, right, his treasures are are immense right they're immense and 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 they're not to be mocked or made fun of like they're massively he is he he he's got it going on that dude whether you like it or not I mean he has made it on this world but I would just tell you that these people are severely limited they're severely limited no matter how much treasure that man or woman has Oprah another just super bold right Super bold, very aggressive, business tycoon, and, and she, is, she is a powerful woman, right? And she is not quiet. She is, she is outspoken and wealthy and one of the wealthiest women in the world, like powerful, right? But, but severely limited in, in, in her uh, success. Um, do me a favor. I don't want to make that claim unless it's 
backed up in Scripture. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 21, all the way at the back of your Bible. Look in Revelation chapter 21. Been people waiting in this church for so many years. Oh, he's going to go to Revelation now. Woohoo, here we go. Here we go. Woohoo. Sorry to disappoint you. No, not there yet. I'm going to preach all through Revelation after we start preaching through the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. Um, no. Uh, Revelation 21. Look at the first uh, eight verses here, okay? Um, remember, happy are those who are humble, okay? Happy are those who are humble. So this is when it all ends, right? This is the end. And I don't know when that is. You don't know when that is. Jesus doesn't know when that is. One day his father's going to say, all right, kid, go. And he's going to come on a horse with a tattoo, and he's going to be a bad mamma jamma. That's my favorite Jesus. Okay, and, he, and it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. Okay, so, so listen, there's people that fight about this. I'm not fighting about it. I'm just, I'm, th- th- okay, I had a discussion with someone this week. And I just want to say that I will always error on what is written. That's it. You can think what you want. You can draw whatever conclusions you want out of the Bible. But where I'm going to stop is where it is written. And the scriptures actually say, do not go beyond what is written. Right? And it says that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Okay? So, I don't know what that earth is going to look like. I don't know if it's going to be exactly right here, or maybe Jesus will shift it to another part of the galaxy or another part of the universe. I don't know, but there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Okay? That's what it says, right? So a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. They're gone. And the sea was also gone. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe. This is a good place. This is going to be great amen spots. Like you can cheer, you can yell. This is the amen section. I want to hear it, right? Jesus wants to hear it. All right, you ready? Ready, ready? Listen. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Awesome. Overwhelming victory is ours in Christ, right? And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious, there it is, right? Overwhelming victory. All those who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. That's a good praises, right? Awesome. There's your inheritance. I want, I, listen, I don't want to get off track here, but I, I got to, if you're going to read the good, I got to read the bad. Because, see, maybe someone's not in the position for that inheritance right here tonight. Maybe you haven't said yes to Jesus. So this is what happens if you haven't said yes. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Yeah, ouch. Did you see the inheritance? You saw that, right? James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see? To the humble. And that's, blessed are those, happy are those who are humble. Why? They'll receive grace. And an inheritance is the ultimate expression of grace. Because an inheritance is not something you earned. It's given to you as a spoiled son or daughter of a king who didn't deserve anything. And he said, if you're mine, you inherit the earth. And you will reign with me. And you will be with me forever. Praise. It's 
a free gift. The gracious inheritance of eternal life, ruling and reigning with Christ on a new earth is promised to those who will humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. Those that won't boast of their self and how important you are and how smart you are and how clever you are and how creative you are. Romans 12.3 says, Don't think you are better than you really are, but to be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Psalm 34.2 says, I will, bo- I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are hopeless take heart. And we're just about done here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Take a look at this, please. This is this, um, we call him the, 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 the mighty, the mighty Apostle Paul. Incredibly powerful man of God. You know, he like, he did miracles and stuff, right? And God used him to write like half of the New Testament. This is an amazing, powerful man of God. And in 2 Corinthians 12, look over at verse 9. This is when Paul asked God to take some thorn out of his There was something going on in his life, whether it was physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. I don't know what it was. Nobody knows. God doesn't want to disclose that to us. If he wanted to, he would. There's some type of a thorn. Maybe it's literally a thorn. Could be. I don't know. But God, he's asking, hey, can you get rid of this? Can you get rid of this? And God's, it says each time God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Blessed are those who are humble. We humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And we don't boast in ourselves. Listen, happiness is found in the exaltation of the king that allows you to join him for all eternity in his kingdom. Amen? Come on up, guys. As these guys come up here, they're going to help lead us into our time of offering and into our time of worship. But let me just say this. Jesus is defragging you. That's what he's doing here. He's, 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 he's changing the, your perspective and your attitude and your priorities and your thoughts. He's, he's changing the way you think about circumstances. He's trying to put them into their proper place in your mind. See, a lot of these things like humbling yourself, it's not easy for a proud man or a woman. It's not easy to, you know, Jesus take the wheel, right? It's not easy. And so that's normally, that would be what, in the bad column, right? I don't want to, I don't want to say no to myself and yes to any, I don't like, listen, I'm, you're looking at a guy who doesn't like to be told what to do from anybody. It's not easy. And, and, it, and, and, and normally that would be in the bad column, right? And, and mourning the loss of something precious to you, that would normally be in the bad column. And, 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 and realizing my great need for him, like, I can't conjure up happiness. I can't conjure up fulfillment. I can't conjure up purpose. I, I can't, nothing else in my life, none of my other horizontal options will bring me purpose and satisfy my soul except for Jesus. Like, that's not, that would be in the bad column. Because it makes you feel like you can't do anything. But God's word, he, he's defragging you. He's saying, listen, boast in your weaknesses. Be happy about the bad stuff. Because when you, when, you, when you lower yourself down and say, all right, God, these things are on me, but even though they're there, I'm going to have overwhelming victory in you. That they're not going to hold me down anymore. I'm still going to fly. I have, I have heaven promised. I have the mind of Christ. I have the Holy Spirit. I have a new reality that I'm living. And the everyday Joe might be down by those things, but Jesus is like, listen, Take those things out of the bad column and put them into the good column. Be happy when people lie about you. No one in this room would say that's a good thing. No one would stand up and preach that that's something that should make you happy. That's what I'm talking about. 
See, the thing is, is every person has a choice to make because everyone's going to be lied about, right? You're going to be insulted. People are going to leave you. They're going to say bad things about you. Everyone goes through that, myself, a lot. And I can choose to get down and defeated, or I can choose to be happy about that and go, you know what? I know people don't like me because I jam this thing right down their stinking throat every single week, but it says that a great reward is waiting for me for following him. So I can be happy because if you don't like me, Miss Susan, I love you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. As long as Jesus is happy with me, it doesn't make any difference what anyone else here thinks. And you don't have that attitude. So it's time to defrag and, and switch the way you think about things into a different column, into the good column, right? And we can be happy. Amen? Awesome.